Right, yeah, folks. <laughs> hey, little, oh, you, you guys. Come on, you must first behave with these guys. Not reasonable. Now, what's happening, folks, is that enterprise systems is reserved only to IT, and but they have the option on doing information security insurance, whereas you, ISA, uh, sorry, forensics investigation people do ISA. Now, they're both designed to be the teaching together is the same. Um, what is different between the two modules is the very precise wording of the title of the assignments. Um, and they are based, uh, and we'll see later on uh, today, just what the differences are. And they're very, very subtle, but they're quite important. So they're tuned. The ISA one is tuned specifically to the sort of things you guys are going to get up to in your future careers as forensics investigation. And for the IT students who are split between <coughs> ISA and Enterprise Systems, Enterprise Systems is more about sort of the development and use of the IT, whereas the ISA is all about sort of governance and other things that are related very much more closely to forensic investigations. And it's probably for you guys a very new way of working. I'm not entirely sure, but it's, it seemed quite new last year to the um, CFF, CFI people, because there's very, very little topic-related teaching. What I'm going to be doing in the lectures, and you can actually look at all of these lectures from last year, or call this a seminar, from last year, those videos for last year's ISAES seminars and for the previous years up there as well. So you've got two, two years lot already there. And it'll be fairly similar this year, but, di but because we're face-to-face, -face, you know, I can see what you're doing, I can see how you're thinking, and we can sort of change the emphasis. It also changes as well as, a, as what's going on in the big wide world, because I keep up to date very much with all of the sort of goings on in the big data world, in the analytics sphere, in governance and so on. Um, <clears throat> so I'll bring a lot of current issues that are happening here, but much of what we're doing <coughs> is kind of pulling together everything that you've ever learned it's called a capstone project, or capstone um, module. And that really means it really brings together everything you've learned module by module, year by year. Same sort of thing that you guys have been doing, but even more so. And how many of you in um, forensic investigations went on placement years last year? So quite a lot of you got real world experience of using some of the techniques, I guess. And so you can bring that into your work as well. So let's just have a little look at the module spec for enterprise systems. The wording is almost identical uh, in both of them. And this part here is slightly different. So enterprise systems, as the ISA people, have a look at the precise learning outcomes. You remember they're the things that at the end of the module you will be able to do provided you've engaged, and you guys who are here are obviously engaging from day one, which is good. That means you're likely to do very well. So that's the sort of words for enterprise um, systems. I'll have a, well, call up the ISA ones as well for you, um, because it's kind of useful to have both of them handy. So for yours, three um, learning outcomes. So this is very much more around security and so on, risk management. This is really very much 
a governance issue, doing things the, the right things the right way at the right time to the right quality, and those sort of questions. And then building into that a threat and risk assessment. Now, all of that comes together in the topic that we're actually going to be doing. And we're all going to be looking at big data analytics. This is the new world. The world of data-driven decision-making. The world which is collecting, has generated in 18 months, or the last 18 months, the same amount of data as the world had generated in history. So you've all heard of Moore's Law in terms of electronic chips. It's now applying to data. It is mushroom. Okay, so a lot of it is multimedia, but things like Twitter and all of the social media are generating data at staggering rates. Uh, the, you've heard of the Internet of Things, I guess, sensor networks. They are generating data, again, at staggering rates of knots. There's a guy from IBM who said a couple, uh, three years ago, the problem with big data is a problem, one of the problems, is a problem of veracity, the need for veracity. And the problem, he said, is that 80% of all of the data that's out there that we're trying to use, we don't know whether it's right or wrong, and if it's wrong, we don't know how much it's wrong by. And we've got some of these guys here doing a, um, their independent study of projects on location services on smart devices. And they're following up what was done by 14 students last year, including one from your uh, area in CF. And they showed that the assisted GPS mechanisms in a smart device are approximately accurate to within 25 meters for 85% of uh, all readings that these things come up with. Okay, so 85% are within 25 metres, that's 75 feet. Depends what you're doing, it's kind of okay. The problem for organisations out in the big world, the real world, uh, retailers, telecoms, manufacturing and so on, is those are the 15% of location data that's created on these gadgets. They have errors from anything from 25 meters up to, and I've had one instance under very, very special circumstances, which are not terribly represented, but it still happens, 1,800 kilometers error. So this veracity problem is kind of interesting and comes into some of these areas. As it happens, their research last year has led to me, us as a university becoming one of the um, experts in location searches ex uh, accuracy in the world. No other university or research uh, group has come up with as much data as we have got. And the group who are working on it today, or now, are going to generate an order of magnitude more data um, than we've already had. We had, in papers that we pub I've published with their names, we're talking about 2,500 data points so far, and that's more than any research paper out there has got. This year we're going to probably, with very many fewer people, we're probably going to generate perhaps 10 to 20,000 data points. And that's me, I mean, one of the results is that I get asked to a lot of conferences now, business conferences, not academic ones, but business conferences about this field. And so what we're going to do <coughs> this semester, and it happens in other modules I've done, and these guys know all about it, you will be, end up writing an article in the Springer LNCS format, not the IEEE format that you used when I think I took you last two or three years ago. But it's a Springer LNCS one, which is slightly more uh, usable than the IEEE one. And any article that you write, which is 70% or better, will be e-edited by some happy little volunteer here into an e-publication that we will then publish um, from the university website so that you can add into your um, CV as a published article. 
but they also feed into my own work so that when I'm actually going to conferences and actually presenting. Your research will be acknowledged and it then gets into what's happening in the outside world where we are beginning to influence the way the big organisations and little organisations look at big data and we're going to be looking at this term as decision making. How do we make valid decisions? How can you cope when the data is of uncertain veracity? How can you carry out effective uh, forensics investigations for a law court case if you don't know the accuracy of that data? Or you don't know how much is accurate or how much is inaccurate? What are the consequences? What are the implications? What are the implications? I mean, for example, when you're doing a forensic investigation, the first thing that everybody knows is the police lock the door down, they bag all of the computers, take them away, and eventually they clone all the hard drives. Now, you've got the data out there on the cloud. You are you're doing an investigation, a criminal investigation perhaps, or it might just be an audit investigation for a small business where everything is out there and there are allegations of fraud. If it was on their own servers, it's easy. You bag the equipment, clone the hard drives, and then carry out your normal process. If they are working on AWS and so on, Amazon's or Google's environment, first of all, you don't know what server or what servers or what disks all the data is spread across. You don't know where the backups are. Google probably doesn't even know where the backups are because it's automated and it just ripples out, doesn't it? So which disk drives are you going to bag and clone? idea? No. So that's part of ultimately the equivalent set of four questions, six questions you have there, which I will now bring up for you. You have for ISA questions of ethics, trust, governance, security, audit, that's the bagged, cloned hard drive, isn't it? Sort of thing. Am I right? So the problem is knowing where your data is at all times. How's that? Yeah. And if you are using software as a service, as SMEs will be using it often now, yes, you kind of know it's come in, maybe off the keyboard of a staff member. They're after it hasn't been changed? How do you know that the data that belongs to my company hasn't been tampered with by someone else because of co-tenancy? You've heard of co-tenancy, have you, in servers, in the, in the cloud? Yeah. So these are the questions you're going to be, in, in the ISA Information Security Insurance, you're going to be asking in relation to big data analytics data-driven decision-making. Enterprise systems are looking at a slightly different variation, <coughs> which is, yeah, we've got this big data decision-making processes, and what are the opportunities, the challenges, the benefits, and the options? And you'll be able to research something about one or other of those topic areas that is of great interest to you. That is the topic it's too big for any one of you to cover the whole of it, so you will choose a particular little bit, and we'll discuss those during each workshop as you do your research, you develop your ideas, and narrow down to something that's really interesting. I'm almost certain that you will all come up with something different. And that kind of makes life a, much more interesting for me marking it, because I haven't got 20 articles which are a clone of each other. 20 different articles of all sorts of fascinating things, and I learn a lot from you guys. So it feeds into what I tell business people outside. 
Do those questions seem interesting to you, first of all? Yeah. <coughs> I know it's interesting to you guys. I don't need, don't need to ask you. But I'm glad that you guys are interested. So the process we're going to go through for the, um, in terms of the assessment, there's two parts to it, actually. And I'll just show you one of them, uh, which is expensive. <coughs> Given there's more of you doing ISA, I'll do this one. A little bit of context. So we've got this guy, John Easton, from IBM, about veracity. The security side of things, you know, smart cars. Not just smart <coughs> cars, but also autonomous cars is going to become kind of significant. And that kind of fits into decision making. Because the smart car or the smart drone or the smart aircraft is going to have to make some decisions. And if you think about the Google car and some others, they are ingesting gigantic amounts of data from their sensors. Their laser range finds their LIDARs, their 3D cameras, all the other things they've got, uh, collecting data about where they are from location services, which are not incredibly accurate. By the way, how many of you drive? How many of you got sat-navs, a sat-nav sat-nav rather than using have you noticed as you go, come up to a crossroads where you're going to turn right or roundabout, it's counting down the number of yards to the roundabout, doesn't it? And you expect it will get to zero as you get to the crossroads. How often does that happen? It's normally about 5 or 10 or 15 yards wrong, isn't it? So there's all sorts of interesting things that we can breathe there. Also, huge amounts of security because as soon as... Because for a variety of reasons, but one of which is almost certainly commercial, there is a single data bus in cars these days, in smart cars. The connected cars, the CAN bus system. It connects all the Wi-Fi and the multimedia and the engine and the actual control system. You've got Wi-Fi, you've got 4G connection, internet connection. Oh dear, what's that? That's an interesting security problem, isn't it? Did you read about the... A little uh, experiment last year where some researchers were able to take control of a Range Rover, I think it was. The Honda. Oh, it was a Honda, Honda uh, big, big Honda, was it? Yeah, and they could control it, steering, brakes, acceleration, and switch the engine off remotely while it was on the motorway. And it was in a ditch. And if you think about the implication of that lack of security, that's potentially a rather serious terrorist problem. Because yeah, all you've got to do in the middle of the rush hour at each end of major motorways, you can cause a massive crash and paralyze the transport system in the UK for several hours. You've all heard of Kaspersky, haven't you? Mm -hmm. The head of um, Kaspersky labs out in, in Russia, security. Did you hear about his comments um, about six, seven months ago when he was talking in interviews in the UK about the problems of, of cyber security. And he was set, talking about, if you want to understand what the security services and governments are most worried about, what field did he recommend they went to see? Can you remember? Die Hard 4. If you haven't seen Die Hard 4 in this context, go watch it. It's a little bit of like the Italian job, um, the second version of the film, um, where they took over the lights, traffic light systems, uh, which, by the way, have also been hacked into by students in uh, authorised research in the States. So the connected anything is potentially a very, very significant issue. So the assignment... It is a portfolio, <coughs> i.e. there are two things you have to do. The first one is a poster that you're going to be spending the next four weeks researching. You will just narrow down onto your topic, your precise topic that you want to uh, work on, that you will be writing your article about. And for the first four weeks, part of the work, or a lot of the work, is going to be finding out the data, the information that characterises why your particular area is really important and provides information 
in an infographic poster sort of form, the data, the graphs or whatever, that will grab the attention of a person who looks at your poster and tell them or make them feel, I need to read that article. Are you all aware of things like, used to things like abstracts, aren't you, the way that we sell our article or our post, uh, the paper to the reader to tell them why it's worth their while investing some time. Think of this infographic poster as a pictorial way of presenting your abstract. Of the problem and the size of the problem, not necessarily the summary because you won't have got, got to that stage, obviously, like that. So, and then the other part is a five-page report for the main written part excludes the title page, the table of contents, the abstract, and the bibliography, but five pages from the beginning of your introduction to the end of your conclusion, in the Springer LMCS format, and five pages going to be around about 2,000 words-ish. And what you're trying to do, you're writing this article to that part of industry, big business, or business sector, particularly SMEs, but you don't have to concentrate only on SMEs, but you're looking for something that organizations do not know that they do not know. Or as that advisor to Bush said long ago, Dick Cheney, the unknown unknown. And the things that we don't know that we don't know about are probably the most dangerous things that are going to come up and bite us when we're running a business, or any aspect of our life. So you're trying to identify things that most businesses probably don't even know they didn't know about it. And then you're trying to tell them why it's important to them and maybe give them some ideas about what they should be doing. That's publications. By the way, those people who volunteer, or that person who volunteers to edit the collection together of the 70% plus uh, article will be able to get another entry in their CV of editing something. Now some of these lot from IT have been editing for the last year or so. They've got p things published in principle from the first year like you guys do, the second year, and now there'll be two, yeah, two things publishable this, semester, this year. Um, in fact, three, because the be I've decided, or we've decided, the best of your presentations 70% or above, with your permission, we'll go up on the web to showcase our use of what's in analytics. If you were happy with us doing that. Um, so we get a lot of publications out of this. It puts, us, puts you in a position where when you're writing your applications, you've got, you know, you've got things that distinguish yourself from all the other student or applicants around you. There's almost no students coming out of universities in the UK have any publications to their name. And we're typically getting 50, 60% of all of the articles that you guys are going to write are going to be at that 70% or above level. Now, even if you typically get a 2 2 or a 2 1 level, most of you are going to get up into the first class honours in this module. Provided you engage, research deeply, and write well. They know about all of this. Um, the one little surprise is that the poster will be assessed by you guys. We will, maybe in here, if we can grab this room, um, you will present, print off your, paper, your poster. Um, I think the timing is going to be week six, because I'm not here on week uh, in week five, I've got a conference down in London. Um, but you will bring your beautiful colour infographic poster. I will provide um, blue tack and you'll spread them around the wall. And I will provide marking sheets. And you will go and assess five of the posters according to criteria which we will develop in week four. We'll actually spend some time in here working out what are the six or eight criteria that you believe are the best way of assessing an infographic poster. What size is the poster going to be? It will be pr produced on A4. Okay. We've tried A3 before now, and that was a serious nightmare. 
A U was expensive for you guys. We did, we did A2. Yeah, we did the second year. Oh, A2. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. A2 is even worse. It sort of takes up that one space. No, it's good. It was a nightmare trying to get a printed on. We could always just try and get a so Thursday, 25th of February, we'll be in somewhere, probably here, and we will then do this peer assessment. Now, is our final grade for the infographic purely peer assessed, though? In the no. You no. What I do. Now what we'll do, we'll have one or two colleagues, I most of uh, will be there, and probably Dave Voorhees, he normally comes, and typically uh, Virginia or maybe Asma will come, and they will mark some as well. What we do then is all of the sheets of paper, you will carefully stack them together for each poster so they align up, so I can actually work out what's going on. I will then record the mark for each one of those in a spreadsheet, and... I will also have in a few other columns those <coughs> marks which I have given and the other academics have given, <coughs> which give a sort of baseline. And then there's a sort of a, an averaging process. I may, if there's some ridiculously low marks or some ridiculously high marks, <coughs> where you know the outliers, I will probably carve those out. So you get. Um, and it turns out that first. You guys, by the time you have created the marking scheme, either carry the criteria and <coughs> only mark on the basis of uh, four columns. There's ODIR, which is worth about 10% or something. OK, good, and wow. Or terms like that. Wow. Yes, that's <laughs> So it, it, you know, it kind of, so it doesn't make it too difficult. You've only got four options: that oh dear or wow, and then a couple in the middle. And then by the time you've got a mix of oh dears and wows and fantastics and etc., it actually produces quite a nice profile. And mostly, almost always, um, the marks that you guys come up with actually are within the nat's whisker of what I would have given you anyway. And it, it, but it is my responsibility. To moderate them, so I will actually look at each actually each poster, <coughs> see what the moderated level is, and does that actually match with what I would have given it? Now, there's a good reason for doing this: is to do with employability. Those of you who were on placement last year realise that you a have to assess your own work all the time and try and get the best possible work done, and secondly, those around you in your teams are going to be assessing each, you're going to be assessing each other. And so it's kind of helping you to develop the sort of understanding of how business works, how you will be working in your teams when you're jock. Um, it doesn't actually reduce the workload. This is to do with giving you better experience to be able to understand how all of these sort of things work. Then the other one is that the report worth 70%, uh, I assess alone. No peer reviewing at all. That's we tried it once, um, and it didn't work very well. Um, but, and there are some dates in here which are the same for both versions. The other thing that's probably new to you guys from CFI is that there will be on the Thursday, the 7th of April, there will be no workshop, no lectures, no seminar, no nothing. There will be a, a schedule. Uh, covering pretty much the whole of the day. Do you have any lectures or seminars on Thursday morning, you guys? Just no. you. Pardon? Just you on Thursday. Just, you. Just me. And the same for you guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll spread it out across the whole day, pretty much, and there'll be a schedule of 15-minute intervals, roughly, maybe a bit more, depends how many there are. Three, no, we'll do it 15 minutes. Um, and you will come and see me. Uh, you will have submitted it the night before, on this Wednesday evening, the 6th of April, and on the 17th, you will come and see me, and I will give you um, feedback based on the rubric, the marking scheme, and so on, about where your article has got to and the things that you can do to improve it. Can 
we approach it beforehand? That's all. Can, we, can we approach it beforehand? That's all. Yeah. That's what the whole, that's the purpose of all the workshop sessions is. We can, I mean, the idea of the workshop sessions, guys, is that you're doing your research, but you've always got me there to ask questions. And, you know, we've got 30, probably about 13, 12 or 13 per um, group. And so that gives, you know, five, six minutes each, four or five minutes each, one to one. So we've got a lot of time where you can be bouncing ideas off me, bouncing ideas off each other, and just sort of developing some really interesting sort of directions. Richard is the poster individual work. Everything is individual in the sense that you will produce your poster, you will produce your article as your own finger work. However, you should be thinking about collaborating with ideas, sharing ideas, sharing some of the research, just so that everybody improves. Now some of you are going to find, because of the way your brain works, because we're all individual, we're all different, you will find sources which no one else has found. Now they might actually be quite useful for some of your colleagues. Might help them to get new ideas, new perspectives. So one of the things about these articles is I want them of the highest academic quality that you can deliver. Now that means that each piece of work it has is a set that you're working with critical analysis from many different perspectives, multiple perspectives. That means, and if you think about an ordinary English paragraph, a paragraph basically deals with one idea, one concept. So, in terms of numbers of references or numbers of citations, I do not give you an answer of how many citations or how many references I want by citing sources. What I will say, however, is <coughs> we're working with critical analysis, which you all know about, which is comparing and contrasting ideas, isn't it? And the citation tells the reader where that idea came from. So if you're doing a descriptive paragraph, one citation at least per paragraph. If you're doing an analytical piece of writing, you have to be comparing from two things at least. That suggests at least two source, two citations. And if you're doing multiple perspectives, well, that still may imply multiple sources, multiple, more than two, in other words, citations per paragraph. That is my only guidance to, how, to you when you're asking how many references they give. Because how many sources do you need to support the different perspectives in each paragraph? Now, having had this formative review on the 7th of April, you then have three weeks to incorporate all of that information you've got from that review session to improve it for submission eve midnight, well, 11.59, Wednesday, 27th of April. And then there will be another schedule, which will probably the same sequence, obviously, for assessment in my office on the 28th of April, which is, the, I can't remember which week of the, um, might be the second week of the exam period. So I'm hoping that most of you will be able to come there, because then you get the mark immediately. You'll know what you've got. So I will add in both the, the mark of that plus your uh, post a mark, and you will leave the office knowing that you've got your 2-1 or first. Now, the interesting thing, and this is applied analytics, which you guys know about, you guys may have all of you learning about. The difference between there and there averages out at about 20% improvement. Well, the intention is that that one is your best effort to that point, which is week 11, I think it is, week 10 or 11, or it should be. Um, so it's probably what you would normally have submitted. <coughs> and then you get the input that says, ah, you can do better. 15 to 20% improvement in your grade, folks. Now, the examiners like it. They like the, the way this, these uh, assessments are done and they approve it strongly, and it delivers some of the highest 
average grades in the university, by the way. So my, the learning analytics are use of analysis tools on the data from marking between the um, formative, final formative, uh, final draft formative review and the final site of assessment I the final grade you're going to get shows uh, that they like the grade profiles. Something like 50 plus percent get firsts. Something like 75 percent get two ones and above. And if you follow what's done across here, there should be nobody getting lower than 55 percent. Now, there are three criteria, and these are identical. Excuse me. Um, yeah, there are three criteria, and they are identical wording on both ISA and ES. 20% of your grade comes from the left hand column. And this one starts at you have 100%, and then this tells you how you lose marks hand over fist if you're careless. Now, 20%, if you format it perfectly using the LMCS um, formatting tools properly, you've got 20% in your bag before you start. There is one small catch which you guys from um, CFI may not have come across before, and that's this one. Again, as an employability issue, of getting this is all about employability. That column, doing writing your reports following the instructions. Now for you guys, if you're going to go to court, or you do it working for uh, some of the consultancies, you will be given templates which you have to follow precisely, aren't you? Almost certainly. And across all of you, you will be working in businesses where they will use templates. Now, templates in Word are a bit breakable, and so that's kind of useful to learn how to deal with at least the Springer and CS one but you will often be given very, very tight uh, length guidelines. And for this one, you have five pages from the beginning of the introduction to the end of the conclusion paragraph, five pages, plus zero lines. It must not leak over, other than when Turnitin blows a fuse, uh, which will be two to four lines error. Um, but in the Word version, it must be exactly five pages, plus no lines, but it could be that much less, so you could do 10 lines short. Now, that's like how most and I work often. We put in a paper for a uh, conference, particularly the IEEE and actually Springer ones as well, and they will say up to six pages. And they mean up to six pages. Two lines over, and they will send out a little request. By the way, that now means you need to pay $100 <clears throat> for that extra page. We don't like paying extra $100, do we, most of them? Because the boss won't pay it, the university won't pay the $100, so we then have to go back to plus zero lines. It means you have to write incredibly concisely to get all your points in. But it's very, very good practice for the future. And if you don't use a template or don't make it work, you can lose all of that 20 marks, which is kind of a pity, because that's the difference between a 2-2 two -two and a first. 55 to 100, uh, 75. The other columns are about the topic and about the argument. So this is all to do with the critical analysis, you're bringing ideas together, um, coming up with unusual conclusions which no one else has come up with, the left field sort of idea. The more of those we get, the better. As I keep telling, I kept telling these guys, there is no right or wrong answer with this module. There are 
they're just great ideas and not quite so great ideas. Great analysis, not quite so great analysis. Great levels of evidence, citations and sources and so on, or not so good. This side, which is on the topic side, is where you are going to use these ideas in the top three bands to work out whether your topic actually has the capability to get 95% in principle. Now, your writing and your use of sources may not actually get there, perhaps. It may only get you to there or there. This will help you work out, is the topic interesting and different <coughs> enough that no one's ever written about that it's worthwhile doing? And there's some guidelines on, in the resources section, uh, in, the, in the assessment section, which helps you look at what are the sort of questions you should ask yourself to work out whether this is a, a really novel topic. Now, the other part that helps this level of uh, grading stick is this term here, and that one there, and that one there. Many of us are peer, peer review um, journal papers, many of us are on program committees uh, for conferences, again assessing the quality of proposals and we go to other uh, lots of conferences. So we see the quality of the ideas, the topic, and so on. And so we know also the difference between what's publishable at a national type of conference or one which is at a much bigger international conference. And many of your, much of your work will be in those two levels. This one, uh, it contributes to the research liter literature, in other words, it's good enough to be in an academic journal, and probably could be presented at a local university research uh, forum. So, and these help to make the very high levels of grades that we get in these models of mine stick, because they have these external connections that make it impossible for the external examiner to say you need to scale them back to a normal distribution centered on 65%. Most of these, uh, sent a uh, median mode is around about 75% or higher. Between 75 and 80% is the mode for, because I've got an unscaled, a robust um, criteria here which cannot be scaled. And lots of people outside <clears throat> who are interested in this sort of approach. Um, I did a presentation at an education conference in Nottingham. Not much time I think it is. It might be next week. The 28th, anyway. I think it might be next Friday we come to think of it. Um, yeah, next week. So, these are sort of things that can make you certain that if I give you 85%, it's not going to get moved. So, I have extremely high expectations of you guys. These guys know that. I'm looking for seriously creative approaches to doing this work. And then this lot will help you to get really, really good grades. Okay, folks? Mm -hmm. So, I'll see you downstairs in a few minutes in the tour where I've just bought. And then you guys in the time. And we'll then go into the, what to do in terms of next week. Hang on. Just zap your cards, folks. Zap yourself. <laughs>